Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to a bonus episode. I know, I know it's a bonus episode and you guys are expecting a live show, um, but here's the deal. Uh, we are in a post-TIFF world where I am still digging out from the amount of stuff that had to do with the Toronto International Film Festival. Gabe is under the weather due to some stuff he picked up at Toronto. He's fine. Everything's rolling along. And then, of course, Jake and Kevin were bogged down with some uh, junket scheduling, and we just couldn't get our acts together to get a full show together for this week. So you're going to have to put up with another bonus episode for one more week uh, and then a premium for people who subscribe on Mondays. Uh, and we should be back at it next week because we're also jam packed with a ton of interviews uh, that we just can't hold off on any longer, including this one, which, as you can tell from the title, uh, is tied to the new film The Woman King by Gina Prince Bythewood. And so on behalf of that uh, movie, we got to sit down with Gina as well as producer Kathy Shulman um, while they were in Toronto promoting the film um, ahead of its September 16th release. And uh, we knew we wanted to get them on Real Blend because of the way that Gina Prince Bythewood uh, directs this picture. Uh, and and the work that she gets out of her cast, uh, specifically Viola Davis and a newcomer that you're going to want to know about named Tussaud uh, Mbadou. And she's just incredible, uh, just a great, great performance by her. And we get into that with Gina and with Kathy. Um, one thing I want to warn you guys going into this bonus episode as well, too, though, not that we get into any spoilers. There's no real narrative spoilers but if you do want to go into the woman king as cold as possible uh we do discuss some specific uh fight sequences and, and a little bit of, of the kills that certain characters do uh during the fight sequences because they're a little bit tied to the development of their characters um i think you guys will appreciate it whether you've seen woman king or not but you should definitely go check out woman king uh in theaters now uh and then maybe circle back around if you want to go into it as cold as possible so Without further ado, this is the Real Blend interview with uh, the Woman King director, Gina Prince Bythewood, and producer, Kathy Shulman. Uh, I want to ask about a very specific uh, moment that sort of leads to a, a bigger question, which is uh, there's a scene on, on one of the battlefields in your film where uh, Viola Davis blocks a bullet with a sword and uh, she drops that sword and then Lashana hands her a new one. And it was so badass that I, I screamed in my ear. I, was alone. <laughs> I didn't disturb anybody, but that's how motivating it was. I want to talk to you about, can you just talk about filming that moment, but also specifically when you have like battle chaos going around you, how you focus in and capture a specific moment like that? Um, well, I love that you love that moment because I love that moment too. Uh, as does Viola. Um, <laughs> it is a... Uh, with big battle sequences like that, um, it can feel like chaos, uh, but the importance is, does it have a beginning, middle, and end? What is the story that you're telling? And within that, what are the character moments that you're telling? And when you can break it down like that, then you, you have individual moments like that. Um, and what does that say? Why do we have it in there? It shows, you know, the skill and badassness of, of um, Naniska. It also shows the incredible sisterhood in that no words have to be spoken. Take mine, I got this. I can take these guys on that have guns with, with, uh, with my bare hands. Um, and so, again, if there's a story to it, then it's not just, oh, this is a cool moment. And so, again, I love that right. you pulled that out. And um, I mean, it was, it was fun to shoot, certainly, um, but also the choreography, Danny Hernandez, who was our incredible stunt and fight coordinator, to be able to design that and design a sequence where you believe that Lashana Lynch, her character Zogi, can defeat two guys with guns when she doesn't have a gun. And it starts with, well, what's the truth? The truth is muskets take a long time to load and fire, so you have one shot. Um, they are not accurate. Um, so you can just move this much and, and miss. And so to be able to start with the truth to build a sequence that we hope is memorable and different. Um, that's the fun of all of it. You know, uh, we talked yesterday uh, for the television press junket, and I was talking to you about Terrence Blanchard, uh, obviously one of the greatest composers of all time. And yes. um, the music in this film is 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 amazing because there, you can go from dramatic to hopeful, and and and, and it's such a beautiful part of the film. It's part of the world as well. Um, I do want to talk about Terrence specifically, like involving your work. But is there a score of his that meant a lot to you? Uh, obviously, over the years, I mean, I you know everything he's done with Spike Lee and everything, but um, is there one of his that meant a lot? And, uh, you know, talk about obviously having him on your project and hearing your that music to your film. 
Um, well, I'm going to sound like an asshole here, but and say uh, love and basketball. That, that yes. Was... <laughs> you know, great that's movie. a great movie. That's a really great movie. <laughs> My sister had that poster on her wall. <laughs> That's a great. But, hey, you you can definitely say that. It's not a bad thing. That's awesome. But I mean, I'm saying it for a specific reason because that was my first film. It was the first time I worked with Terrence, and I had never worked with a composer before. And I had what is affectionately, not really, called Temp Dub Love, where I fell in love with my temp score. Terrence came in, <laughs> scored the film, and initially I was like, oh, "No, I don't like this. I, I want." more of what that was. I'm sure, I can't believe he worked with me again after that. Um, but it, it took me like six months um, after the fact. Um, he sent me a DVD of the score pieces, which he does, which is amazing. And I listened to it and I was like, oh my God, this is actually a really good score. And God, I was a Great jerk uh, and an idiot throughout the process. Um, but he's forgiven me. Um, but I just love what he did thematically. And so when it came time for The Woman King, you know, we were talking about who should do the score, and it was pretty immediate, um, Terrence Blanchard. But in addition, we knew that we wanted some songs within that, and uh, Lee Boehm, his name was brought up, who's uh, most famously known for Lion King and what he created for that, and really felt like the combination of those two could be really special. And... Uh, Lee Boehm created the songs within um, that the characters dance and sing to. And Terrence's score, um, we talked about wanting to do something different that we hadn't heard before. Um, and that was really a classic orchestral sound done with African instrumentation uh, and then adding voice and choir to that. And how can you make African instrumentation become a classic sound? And... It's one thing to say that, and, oh, that sounds cool, but he actually was able to do that. And we flew to Scotland over a four-day period to, to uh, record it with an 85-piece orchestra, and he flew in a choir, flew in Diane Reeves for the voice, um, had the African um, artist to do the drumming, and it was mm. the most inspired um, coming together of director, composer that I've ever had it was you know as we know our whole thing was rushed everything was rushed post was rushed um but it was us in in this concert hall not going home sleeping there waking up for two hours um just coming up with ideas giving comments on it it was just this non-stop thing and it could have been tragic it could have been you know wow. terrible because we were moving so fast but he was so inspired by this film and and um to be able to tell the story of these women and this culture and, and his culture and um it just it was a beautiful experience um that i'll never forget that was incredible uh this awesome. question's for both of you really because in in addition to obviously being just incredibly entertained by this movie one of the things that i genuinely appreciated is that i felt like i was honestly learning about a culture that I otherwise just, if I'm being honest, was not knowledgeable about. So I'm curious as storytellers, both of you, how important is that for you, that kind of that balance between making sure that we as an audience are entertained and that it's a fantastic film and we walk out just super pumped based on what we've seen, but also like kind of learn something. I know, I know like educational isn't like the sexiest promotional <laughs> tool in the world, but like I did love that I learned about a culture that I didn't know about. Well, you know, so did we. I mean, I think, you know, it all began uh, a long time ago in 2015. And, you know, um, originally, you know, our friend and colleague, you know, Maria Bello went to Benin and she came back and told me the story about the Agogia. And I, I really had no idea. And so it began as an educational process for us, which was to read everything we could get our hands on and a lot of it in French, which was no easy matter. Um, quite a slow burn. And uh, <laughs> we did. As one does. As one does when reading French <laughs> literature from the 1900s, 1900s. But also we were dealing with the issue that it was all from the perspective of, of a sort of Western gaze. So, you know, from the very beginning, while being educated on it, you always have to question, you know, the source and where it's coming from. And we did a lot of that. And then, you know, eventually you move into the area of, 
you know, doing historical fiction and, and what does that really mean? That means you use the research wherever you can um, to tell your truths and identify true, you know, points in time and realities about certain places and people. And then the rest, you know, becomes invention um, through a responsible lens that you've learned, you know, that, you, that you've grown through the, through the process of, of the educational, you know, bit. And then it, it, it sort of goes into the creative um, exploration and where you should take over. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's um, the fun part of this type of thing. Historical epics is in the same way, you know, Braveheart was an absolute template. It's one of my favorite films. We talk about nonstop yeah. about a template for this film that you're creating these fictional um, relationships within a real world. Everything happening within our story was historically accurate. Um, the conflict between the homie and Oyo, um, King Gezo, at the time of our film, um, having just ascended the throne, having taken it from his brother, um, all those elements are the reality of it. And um, so it was an easy balance for us to be able to tell the story of these real women, um, but we want to add story to it. We want to add characters that you can connect with and root for and, you know, tell this heroic story within it, um, within a real um, template in the real world. Kathy, I want to stay with you for a second, because yesterday when I spoke with uh, Gina and we discussed the COVID shutdown, essentially, uh, she mentioned something that in hindsight now is fine to say that the time had to be terrifying. She said she was genuinely concerned that the cast might not be able to come back. Yes, so I, remember. I, just like to get, I remember her terror. I want to hear <laughs> I want to hear the producer's side of that story. What happens when you hear that, oh, your cast might not return? Well, I don't think I ever feared it as much as... Gina did because I had the faith in her and knew they had the faith in her and they were going to come back for her. Um, but certainly the notion of letting people leave before even being at the midpoint, right? It was uh, three weeks it in. It was like three weeks in, yeah. And so before even being at mm. the midpoint, and I think what was so terrifying at the time is that, you know, it was really at the beginning of the Omicron, you know, uh, strain of the virus. And because it was breaking through the vaccinations, we really had no idea, you know, how much havoc it could wreak. And so there was the real concern mm -hmm. that if this grew into a problem bigger than any of the former COVID problems we'd all been, you know, dealing with as a world, that, you know, maybe mm -hmm. this destination and, and the return to work, either or or both could be impossible. So it was pretty terrifying. And I think that's why Gina and I both stayed. Like we refused to leave <laughs> because we had to sort of anchor ourselves there and make sure that we'd be there for the next stop. And it became this like aggressive push to get back to work, um, which every day we wanted it to be tomorrow that we could continue. And, you know, and, and then of course we hit the Christmas holidays. So we, or, you know, we had to kind of go through that as well. But um, yeah, it was a scary time. And then obviously, as a producer, you know, just bringing everybody back in a safe way and knowing that we, you know, we're really, you know, first and foremost, you've got the movie, but also we've got, you know, the lives of people, you know, responsible. And there are thousands of people involved in this movie. So it was a big responsibility Absolutely. to put everybody back to work. But we actually were able to do it. And and as a matter of fact, the, you know, that particular moment, um, you know, in the pandemic sort of moved through that area really quickly and was gone pretty much by the time yeah. we got back to work. So it really wasn't that bad once we were there. Our listeners are people who love filmmaking. They want to learn about like shots and, and how things are done. I want to highlight Polly Morgan because I remember we guys, we had John Krasinski on the mm -hmm. show and he talked a lot about Polly who shot Quiet Place Part 2. Um, and I, I talked to you yesterday about too. she shot yeah. where the crawdads thing, which looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah she's, she's an amazing, so amazing good. DP. Um, but I want to talk to you about yesterday about the, about the PG 13 rating and kind of how, yeah, uh, I, I, I think this is an interesting topic because like the film does a great job of, of still is feeling realistic and the rating doesn't keep it down at all, in my personal opinion. But the, the idea of how you had to shoot things at night or in certain angles in order to keep from getting an R. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we made the decision early on to go for a hard PG-13 instead of an R. And trust me that it's tough because I knew what this film was. Um, I knew there were battles and you never wanted to feel soft um, because this is... It doesn't. <laughs> no. It's so awesome. So and that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. So... Uh. so um, so in knowing that, and the number of times I said hard PG-13 as opposed to just PG-13, like that was the mantra. 
Um, <laughs> but it is, is how can you creatively shoot this so as to hide things, but make an audience feel like you've seen it. And um, it was it was a lot of creativity with um, in speaking with Polly and speaking with Danny Hernandez our stunt and fight coordinator, how do we design these fights so that then our moving camera, it's like just as a stab happens, you know, we've just come off of it. But through that and through sound, sound was so important. Becky Sullivan, our sound yeah. designer, who's, who's amazing, um, you know, a sound can do a lot where you literally think, I just saw somebody get stabbed through the neck. But actually, you know what? You didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Gina, I'll tell you the scene that, uh, this where the sound because I'm a f- big fan of how movies are put together and kind of like just even a cut in a in a when you have an edit could actually uh, make a punctual note of like a of a stab or something like that. But the Lashana Lynch's nails <laughs> going into that eyes um, oh in the my. beginning of is one of the most incredible. I mean that whole fight scene is amazing, but that had to be reliant really on sound. It had to be right. Yeah, you didn't see the eyes. Right. I thought I saw it. And that's the fun. That's the amazing part about movie making is I'm like, oh, wait, I actually didn't see it go in, but I thought I did. That's yeah, crazy. that's and that's also Terrilyn Shropshire, our editor. Um, it took a lot of creativity on her part as well. And and that's why it's great that we have such a relationship where she comes about aboard early. So she's in those conversations with Danny and Polly oh, cool. as opposed to coming into the end. So she knows oh, the wow. intention. She knows how I shot it. Um, but the nails thing was exciting too, cause that came out of research <laughs> that they really did that. That was yeah. really uh, one of their weapons that and the palm oil greasing up their bodies so that their opponents couldn't get a, gr- a good grip on them. Um, that kind of stuff is what differentiated these women from, from other warriors that you've seen. And some of the best oh. action I've seen in years, by the way, I want to tell people that because like Thank generally you. speaking, when you see action in films, there's so many cuts and you can't see things. You actually see it all and it all feels real. So thank you for making good, visible action. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I give uh, props Gina, honestly, the, John Wick. John Wick changed the game like we were in a phase where everybody was trying to to mimic um, Born Identity um, mm. and John Wick oh, brought yeah, it back yeah. to what it should be where you get to actually see what's happening love Chad that Chad Stahelski knows what he's doing yeah <laughs> Chad and David are amazing those guys are awesome Gina one of the things that really struck me whenever I was watching sort of this this big ensemble cast is how genuinely close they all felt uh, on camera like you could fit you could feel it wasn't just actors that showed up on the day and they happened to be in the same frame like it really felt like there was something there so I'm curious did you guys do anything at at the end of the day when you guys were done filming like well what did you do to sort of help facilitate it off camera to sort of bring them close together as a group so that it translates on camera like did they have little parties like woman king parties at night little pajama parties um, <laughs> <laughs> those were masked Pajama parties. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, There's a hair braiding scene. Maybe <laughs> there you go. That was, that was Comparing the scars. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's, that's part of the rehearsal process. That started right from the beginning. It started absolutely with the training. Um, the training was next level difficult and started months before and they needed each other to get through that. Um, it was an incredible bonding experience for all of them to go through that together, to feed off each other, to be competitive with each other, um, to lift each other up. And, and then for me, I love to just put people together in situations that mimic what they're going to be doing on screen. And, um, so whether it be uh, Jordan and Tuso, who who played Nawi and Malik, you know, mm-hmm. having them go on a dinner date, you know, you guys have to be there and talk in character. Um, certainly Lashana and Tuso, their characters, um, their relationship is so important. They're, they're mentor-mentee. And so being able to put them together, have these conversations, go deep into their backstories and, and let them feed off each other and get to know each other. Um, Nawi and uh, Fumbe, played by Masali and Tuso, um, we specifically put them in the same hotel so that they would always be around each other. When they had mm. training sessions, weightlifting, I would put certain people together so that they had to train alone, get to know each other, rely on each other. Um, because, as you said, I mean, these are actors, and yes, you can pretend to like each other, that's your job. 
but they're intangible things that show up when you truly care about somebody, when you truly like each other. And that's what was showing up on screen and what we noticed and then kept feeding. Love that. Uh, this is going to sound like an odd setup, but um, I, I heard an interview with, with Jerry Seinfeld one time uh, where he, he had, <laughs> had to talk, talk about, about the fact that they were every time he got introduced by an opening comic, they were always like, and he's the greatest comic of all time. And he would come out and perform and then he'd go backstage and he would say to the guy, don't ever introduce me like that, because immediately the audience is like, all right, how great are you really? Like they sit back with an expectation. So you have a monologue that comes out and he's like, these are Goje, they're the most badass women of all time. Like, then you have to sell that. So at what point during the weapons training did you feel comfortable of like, oh, all right, I figured out how we're going to be able to really convince people that these women are as lethal as they are? Um... Well, it literally started the day I called Danny Hernandez. Um, I knew his skill set. I knew how good he was. And I knew part of his genius is how he works with actors. He doesn't force them into his box. He creates a box that they're going to look best in. And in starting there, in starting with how do we make each individual actor, each individual character have their own style, um, you know, Tuso is 5'3", you know, but she's hella fast. So let's build that into her skill set. Viola is crazy strong. Yeah. So let's, you know, let's, that's her skill set. Lashana, you know, Lashana came in with the, the most experience. She, she could do any, uh, anything. Um, so we kind of gave her everything. Um, but they all had incredible <laughs> work ethic and all wanted to be great. So I knew that they would put the work in. Um, but I will say maybe, I think it was, uh, like two weeks before we started filming, uh, we shot the enemy village first, which was the opening of the film, which is both really smart and really stupid to do. Um, it's stupid because you're literally shooting some of the hardest stuff first and the crew hasn't gelled yet. And, um, mm -hmm. The actors are super intimidated. But on the flip side, we literally could spend those those two weeks before filming working on just that um, so that when we go in, no one's forgotten the choreography. Mm -hmm. No one's forgotten anything. We just go. Um, and it was in those rehearsals that I suddenly I was seeing the characters. I was seeing the determination. I believed them. That was the biggest thing because um, it's and it was funny because I, I would remind them it's like. You can't just do the choreography. You are stabbing a body. This is going through bone and nerves and skin. Like, put that in your head. Show that intensity because it's going to show up in your muscles, how you flex and, mm. and show up in your face. And um, so those constant reminders of the reality of what they're doing, they embraced. And um, it, was, it was then that I said, oh, they're going to bring something extra. I believe them. And that was exciting to see. You know, I think there's another element, which is that, you know, in this action that really sets it apart is there's never a time that one of the characters does something in an action sequence that isn't directly connected to her story and her arc. And that's a really unusual thing, you know, mm -hmm. that that each and every piece that you see is connected to the psychology of what that character has gone through and where they're headed. So it also informs this incredibly um, sort of verite action with character motivation. And I think that's what makes it sets up set, you know, that really sets it apart so that it's not just a bunch of things you're watching. It's coming straight from the heart, you know, of the characters. Yeah, I mean, I think the the rope mm -hmm. is a really good example of that. The little through line of now we, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, saying the rope is not a weapon, not knowing how to do it, um, trying to get her friend to teach her. And then in the oil battle, she's got that rope tied to her machete and doing some really cool, I was going to say shit, but yeah, some oh. cool shit. You can say it. You, you, say you can totally you curse. Can yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that earned podcast. some cool <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah. We had, we had Kevin Smith on this week. You, you, they're all the cursing that happened in that interview. Like, totally. Um, I know. I feel that I'm moment, right. like, also when Masali, you know, who plays Fumbi, when when she slices the, you know, the Achilles, the Achilles tendon of, mm. of her opponent. Oh, and like, yes. This is somebody who oh. mm. was said, I don't even belong here. I'm not a warrior. And so when you finally see her do that, you're like, come on. You actually pulled that <laughs> off. And it works. And, you know, she makes that kill. So, yeah, I think it's that.
I want to bring up I, I, I'm fascinated by little things in movies and, and the scars really are a massive <laughs> character in the movie. Um, and I, I'm going to bring this up. This might be a random transition because, uh, you know, Sean did the Seinfeld thing. And I, I had something that I thought about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm re I'm rewatching a lot of older films right now, and I watched uh, Hitchcock Strangers on a Train recently. Um, and when that film opens, the first thing you see of the characters is their shoes as they walk to the train before they have their meet, um, Farley Granger and Robert um, Walker. And so, but prior to seeing their faces, we judge them already or know or kind of already start thinking about their characters based on the shoes they're wearing. Um, and so as I'm watching your film, I'm and I'm introduced to the characters, I, I'm seeing all the different scars on the characters, whatever scars they might have. And I'm wondering, like, oh, what battle was that? How brutal was that fight? What, 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 what have they been through? It tells you a lot, even subconsciously, about who the person is. Um, can you speak on little things like that? I know they are bigger in the world of what we're talking about, but they are small details that we latch on to and start to base our character judgments on them. Oh, foremost, I love that you noticed that uh, because that was such a important part in each of these actors creating their characters. And, um, you know, these are warriors. They're going to have scars. And what are these scars and where did they come from? So, you know, I'll speak on Lashana and Azogi. You know, the most important one to her, there were two. The next scar, um, which almost killed her um, in her backstory and her, the, burns on her hand, which was, you know, from her as a kid burning somebody that was trying to take her virginity. Um, and so it was so much of the storytelling and the character building of, of who these women were. Um, and every single actor, it was like, it was fun to come up with a story for each of these scars, but it said so much about them. And for us, Naniska had the most because it's Naniska. Um, Izogi had the second most because she's so reckless. So she had stuff on her back. She had stuff across the neck, on the shoulder, on the arm, on the leg. Um, and it says a lot about her where Amenza, Sheila Team, she only had a couple because she fights with a spear. So she's always mm -hmm. at a distance to her opponent. So in thinking about it that way and being really specific to character, um, it was a lot of fun to do. Yeah, and it yeah, was, it's it was, interesting what you do. You almost judge them. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that it was an enormous production challenge. So I also appreciate your noticing it because <laughs> they took hours and hours to do, and they fall off, <laughs> and they slide off when you're also oily. <laughs> and so we had so much star scar talk through the entire <laughs> production that you know. But and there were times when we got frustrated, like is this even going to work? But I think that the commitment to it became a really, really distinguishing factor. Yeah. And to your point, the next scar, I, that, I, that was the one that I looked at and I was like, oh, she's been through some insane fights. Like, like it, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty it, those little things and those details are so fascinating to me. Like, they and then, really of course, yeah. And then, of course, now he's scar, you know, is the secret, you know, to a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Shh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so we have to get you out of here on this one, guys, and I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, but Gina, I'm, a, I'm an enormous uh, Spider-Man fan, and now having seen this uh, and imagining you doing a Silver Sable movie, uh, it just, <laughs> I can't uh, accept the fact that this might not be the case. Um, so uh, where are we at all with Silver and Black? Is it completely dead, or are you uh, still stoking those flames? Um, I, I, it was, it was those two characters. Silver Sable is an incredibly dope character. Her backstory is insane. Um, I was excited by it. It didn't come to fruition and old guard did. Um, mm. I, I don't know where we are with that right now. Well, tell them to watch Woman King and then say, yeah. give, me, give me this movie. <laughs> That's what I would say. Well... We know you guys have been super busy with Toronto and uh, and the premiere of this. And so we can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, we're enormous fans of the movie. Congratulations to both of you guys. And uh, and again, thank you for coming on Real Blend. Oh, thank you thank guys you for having much. us. Thank you. Bye. Take care, guys. Thank you so much to our friends at Sony Pictures for setting us up with this interview uh, with Gina and Kathy. And thank you to both of them for coming on to the show. So, OK, I know you don't get a full episode this week, but go back and listen to our conversation with Zach Kreger, who's the director of Barbarian. That is a spoiler filled conversation about that movie. Make sure you check that movie out while it's in theaters. People uh, like Edgar Wright are raving about that movie. 
on social media and saying you got to go see it with a crowd. And it's absolutely the case. And Zach talks about a lot of things that went into his uh, interpretations of putting that movie together. Uh, in addition, I can tease that next week we will have the director of uh, See How They Run, which is a murder mystery film with Sam Rockwell and Saoirse Ronan. And because we can uh, say this, it's in the can. We have done it. Uh, Baz Luhrmann is coming on the show uh, and he's going to talk about Elvis and his career. And Baz, you, you guys know we love him. And he is a great, great conversationalist and storyteller. And you will not want to miss that episode when it drops. So keep it here for all things Real Blend. Uh, hit subscribe. Turn on your notifications. We are dropping videos on the regular and we want to make sure that you guys come on over and enjoy every single one of them.